honorable chairs, <laughs> fellow delegates. Today, we had a lot of fun. We went through the procedure, and we talked about if Hawaiian pizza was indeed the best pizza. We indeed found it was not, at least some. But today, I don't want to talk to you about Hawaiian pizza, necessarily. I want to talk to you about the activity that you're participating in and the context in which it is something incredibly important for not just today, but for the last 100 years. 100 years ago, 1918, the world had just experienced one of the most frightening events in human history, the First World War. A few days ago, 100 years ago, the Ottoman Empire surrendered to the great powers. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, one of the longest established monarchies in Europe, fell apart. And soon, the German Empire will follow suit, and the war will be over. But what was found 100 years ago in the year 1918 was a world without diplomacy. It was a world where the hard power of states ruled all, and diplomacy was conducted at the barrel of a gun. Just 18 years before this, in the year 1900, the world was very similar to what we see today. The world was connected. There was, indeed, many economic frameworks established between states. Just like you can get things from Amazon today, you could get goods from around the world from one place to another in pretty amazing time. At the same time, there was one thing missing from this economic miracle full of technological advancement, medical breakthroughs, and indeed cultural revolution. And that was indeed the lack of diplomacy. Diplomacy is something in which humans, leaders of states, found ways to talk. They found ways to converse with one another and in the breakdown in 1914 of relations, and again after this in 1937 with the Japanese invasion of China, and with the German invasion in 1939 in Poland, diplomacy broke down. The institutions we had set were destroyed in the matter of an instant. 1945, the world found itself through another great war. Another great war in which diplomacy seemed to be the only answer from keeping humanity away from sheer destruction. In 1948, the Charter of Human Rights was founded, the first document ever giving universal human rights to people around the world. In 1950, the United Nations Security Council successfully voted to intervene in Korea, protecting a sovereign nation from what was indeed an act against its own sovereignty. The Suez Crisis in 1956 demonstrated not just the power of the great powers, but indeed the diplomatic efforts of smaller countries, most notably Canada, and its attempts to negotiate peace and prevent Soviet intervention into Egypt. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1968, one of the most destabilizing years in human history, where multiple countries in the world faced conflict, occupation, Leaders were able to come together and agree that we should stem the tide of weapons. And how was this assembled? Because we decided to talk. Cyprus, 1974. The United Nations sends peacekeeping units into Cyprus and successfully negotiates a peace. Again, after so much war in Europe and around the world, they decided to talk. And finally, the last example I will give is Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990 where after the Cold War, both Soviet Union and United States, both at the table, agreed that the violation of sovereignty has its limits and successfully voted to protect the sovereignty of a nation at war. Today, in 2018, we see a better world. Indeed, we live in the greatest year in human history. There is less disease, war, poverty than ever before. And that's something we tend to forget when we see the headlines every single day telling us that the world is getting worse and worse. Indeed, because human beings are talking, sharing information, being diplomatic, and getting to know one another simply, we've built a better world for ourselves. And there's a great quote, uh, and I'll see if you guys can guess afterwards who this is. 
For the first time, because the people of the world want peace and the leaders of the world are afraid of war, the times are on the side of peace. That was by Richard Nixon, actually, an individual who many will believe, and rightfully so, was a very controversial figure. But through his ability to foster communication between both communist states, democratic states, dictatorial states, they were able to build the frameworks that allowed peace to continue up until the 80s. UNA Canada is one of the organizations that is helping you run this conference today. We're an organization that looks to bring young minds from around the world to experience this birth of diplomacy and in order to fully appreciate the UN frameworks that have been put in place to this day. If it was not for these UN frameworks, the world would look very different. It might not even exist. And so today I'd like to explain why Model the United Nations is so important. You learn empathy. You learn experience, experiences that will last the rest of your life. You learn to work with others. You learn to formulate your own opinions. You learn to be a good diplomat and indeed a better person afterwards. I've been doing Model United Nations for eight years. It's a very long time. And I feel very old because of it. <laughs> but at the same time, after eight years of doing Model UN, I find that I can talk to people better, I can express my opinions coherently, and in the words of Niccolo Machiavelli, where there is shouting, there is no true knowledge. This weekend, you will learn to speak to one another, write to one another, and negotiate with one another, finding compromises. You will bring forth opinions of states that could seem quite controversial, and indeed, you might not share those opinions of yourself, but in the end, you'll figure it out that when human beings talk and when we do not resort to violence to solve our disputes, we build a better world. When we talk out opinions that may be wrong, we can show them as wrong by talking. But if we give in to our impulses to fight, to yell, to scream, to kill, we only give legitimacy to those who wish for us to complete those actions in full. I finish this by saying that through Model UN, you won't just learn diplomacy. You're going to build better connections for your life. I have many friends to this day who I would have never had before if I had not done this activity. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the adventure. And for those who have not already started and are brand new to Model UN, welcome to an activity that will not just influence the way you do things academically, but bring you proper and at the same time, valuable experience to your social life as well. I leave you with a quote from Lester B. Pearson regarding the state of Canada in terms of the Suez Crisis. Nothing, I suppose, could be better demonstrate than the Suez Crisis the extent to which the United Nations has remained a central factor in our foreign policy. Our problem was, and is, one of long-standing how to bring about a creative peace and a security which will have a strong foundation. It remained my conviction that there could never be more than a second best substitute for the UN in preserving peace. I hope that today, after you go and you negotiate, you see all these different positions, that you continue on to the future, you continue believing in the value of diplomacy, and you bring forth an even better future for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Principal Ron Rembaran. He is a graduate of both McMaster University and University of Toronto. Uh, he has also worked at Columbia International College in Hamilton, Ontario since 1980, and he had retired uh, from the school in 2016. Mr. Rembaran was elected private school representative of the first governing council of Ontario College of Teachers, and in 2005, he received the Hamilton Spectators Publishers Award for Educators. He is also the past chair of the Independent School Associations of Ontario. Mr. Rambaran had received on community boards, including the Industry uh, Educational Council, and was a founding director in the Hamilton Training Advisory Board. 
He is three times past chair of Hamilton's Crime Stoppers Board and has served on this board for 20 years. He was the 2015 recipient of Crime Stoppers International Civilian of the Year Award. I'd like to uh, kindly uh, introduce uh, Ron Rambaran. Give a round of applause, please. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I'd like to thank Sean and the United Nations team and the United Nations Association of Canada and members of Student Development for inviting me here this evening. I'd like to also, again, give a shout out to our partner school, Columbia International School in Taiwan, and it's wonderful to see you again. I, ha I was lucky to spend a week there last, last June, it was, June 2017, and I had a really great experience there. So again, welcome, and we look forward to seeing you here uh, in January, or next year, right? Yeah, wonderful. So it's an honor to speak in front of so many young people who are motivated to make the world a better place. And during dinner, I sort of circulated among many of the groups and I asked you, what do you hope to get from this conference? And most of you responded, public speaking, exactly. Most of you said, we would love to learn how to do better public speaking. We'd love to be more confident and be able to present our case. And that's a wonderful goal. But what are you going to do with it? It's great to learn how to public speak. But that is not an end in itself. You have to learn to use that to make the world a better place. So tonight, I'm going to tell you about five young people who changed the world. I want you to pay special attention because they didn't set out to change the world. They set out to address an injustice or something that they wanted to do, and in the process, they did change the world. So let's go to the first one. First, was a 12-year-old girl who decided, there she is, to change the life of an underprivileged girl by funding her education. She asked for a sewing machine for her birthday and taught herself how to make reversible headbands to sell at her school. Soon enough, she made enough money to put one girl through school. But she didn't stop there. Since then, Mary Grace Henry, who you see in the middle, has made thousands of hair accessories and has sent 115 girls in Kenya, Uganda, Paraguay, and Haiti to school with her program, Reverse the Course. Notice she didn't set out to change the world. She set out to help one person, and in so doing, it expanded and expanded to her helping the world. Next, a 15-year-old American boy who decided to climb the tallest mountain in each continent. There he is. By completing the seven summits, Jordan Romero was the youngest person to complete this difficult task. There were many negative critics surrounding his climbs, suggesting he was not old enough or mentally prepared to accomplish this feat due to his age. Jordan persevered and accomplished the seven summits, which has only been done by 275 humans. And he may continue to have the record for the youngest, because now China has passed a rule saying you have to be a certain age to climb a cer a certain peaks. So he may remain forever the youngest person ever to do this. But he didn't set out to change the world. After he finished the seven summits, he said, you know what, I hope this inspires other young people to find their Everest, to be goal-driven and live a healthy lifestyle. And his example will change the world. 
Next is my favorite, because it's someone I grew up with. And it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Anyone recognize this person? Pele, of course. I, I was born in South America, and so I grew up with Pele. Not with him, but close. I mean, uh, uh, next country over. Right? S several decades ago, this 17-year-old soccer sensation got elected to play for his home country, Brazil, in the 1958 World Cup. He led Brazil to their first World Cup victory. He's now noted as one of the best people in the game. And those of you who watched the uh, World Cup this past, you must, have, you must have seen Neymar, right? Boo, but yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> Pelé is now, his legacy is undeniable. He was born to a very poor Brazilian family, and he became an international superstar and actually helped to mobilize a lot of young, poor kids in Brazil to play soccer, to try to raise themselves and do better for themselves. He was a source of hope and confidence and helped them to overcome their hardships. He, he didn't set out to change Brazil or the world. He loved to play soccer. But in doing what he loved, he did change the world. I was very fortunate, actually, this last, um, this, in June. I, I was in Rio de Janeiro, and I was uh, touring Rio, and happened, and the bus, the tour happened to take us to his home. And that was a wonderful experience to me personally, saying, there's a home that my hero lives in, right? That's Pele. At the age of 13, this next young man, who I'm sure you will know as soon as you see the picture. I know, I know, I know. So I don't have to say much more about him, right? You know who Justin Bieber is. How has he used his fame to help the world? He didn't set out to change the world, but he did. Today, the money he, is ra he has, he supports more than 25 charities worldwide, such as the Red Cross, Save the Children, and World Vision. So even though he is a superstar singer, which, okay, you guys probably like him, I don't know. <laughs> his support of these charities helps to make the world a better place. Now there's one last person I'd like to talk about. And again, I, I've been around the world a few times, and I've had the privilege of listening to her speak at an international conference in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, a few years back. And I'm sure you know who this is, Malala. You've heard the name before, but I'll refresh your memory. In our home region, in Pakistan, the concept of education for females was in opposition to the local Taliban rule. Malala was a passionate student, striving for success, but one day she was forced into a circumstance that changed her life forever. On October 9, 2012, she was attacked by a member of the Taliban due to her insistence on a right for education. She was in critical condition for several weeks and miraculously recovered from her injuries. She didn't set out to change the world, but the world took notice, and people in her community came to her side to defend the right of fair education for all. She's now a prominent education activist, strongly encouraging the world that equal education for all, equal education for all is the best way to have a better world. By her actions, and through her ideals. She has become the most influential young person in the world. She has spoken at the United Nations General Assembly, and she's been the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in history. She persevered through a life-threatening event and began her fight with the notion of helping others in her community to get a proper education. And now it has spread worldwide. 
So it's clear from these five young people that you are capable of having a lasting impact on the world and of changing social expectations. You don't have to set out to change the world, but sometimes one step will lead to that change. It's vital for every single person in this room today to contribute to improving the world that we live in. The purpose of organizations like the United Nations is to bring contrasting views together in one place, to create a dialogue that is focused on cooperation and the enhancement of our shared planet, the Earth. Organizations like the UN strive to create equal opportunity for all and focus on the enhancement of living conditions for every human being on the planet, regardless of creed, ethnicity, or gender. Model UN, as you were told earlier, is all about different points of view on the same issue and finding a solution that works for all. Dialogue, ideas, positive leadership, resolution, tolerance, democracy, and respect. These are the fundamental elements of Model UN and must certainly be the fundamental aspects of our everyday behavior. Looking at the last slide now, <laughs> how many of you can see yourself in one of those slides next year or five years from now when I make this speech. Put your hand up if you see yourself. Next year, or the year after, or two years, or 10 years from now. Who would like to do something that will make the world a better place? Put your hands up. You all do, I know that. And tonight, today, you're taking the first step to make the world a better place. Congratulations, and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. All right, so I would like to invite Sean up here again because it's time to get this officially started. So, how many of you here have been to a MUN conference before? You know what I'm about to do. Okay, I declare CIC Maldi UN officially open.